Hey everybody, this is Pastor James. Welcome back to Pioneer Baptist Church's YouTube page. I want to invite you all to grab your Bibles, open them up to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in the final chapter, chapter 16, and we'll be covering the first four verses today. Let's say a quick prayer, and then we'll jump right into the text. Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your word, for the ability to listen to it together and to be shaped by it. I pray that everyone who listens today would soften their heart, open their mind, and be willing to be molded by you. Lord, today we're going to learn about being generous, being prepared, and I pray, Father, that you would allow us to incorporate these um, lessons into our life. We ask, God, that you just bless us as we draw near. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everybody. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we're just starting to uh, begin this chapter. It's the closing of the book of Corinthians. And so what we're going to do is see Paul uh, tidying up some loose ends. One of the loose ends that he's going to tidy up is one final um, response to questions that at some point the Corinthian church had delivered to Paul. This whole book is a series of Paul answering questions about what it is it means to be a Christian, especially when there are competing ideas in a culture. And so I hope that you have followed us through this series, and I hope that you have um, been encouraged and um, are a better Christian for having read 1 Corinthians and experiencing it with us. What I want to do right now is answer one final question before Paul starts turning his attention towards future plans. Um, there is a question lingering about a collection for some saints that are in Jerusalem. Okay, so we're going to have to talk about who the saints are, why there was a need for a collection, and we're going to also find out um, that the people in the church over in Corinth, as well as the church in Galatia, uh, are uh, likewise both instructed uh, to contribute to the work or to the needs that are going on in Jerusalem. And so what we're going to do is we're going to see that today we still have a responsibility um, to give and to and uh, entrust our tithes and offerings to representatives from our churches so that the people who are in the work of the ministry and the people who are struggling in the ministry can be provided for and so that the kingdom of God will continue to go and it will continue to grow. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great blessing to be a part of the kingdom of God and every one of us has our own role to play in it. Many of you listening today may be called out as missionaries you may be called out as youth pastors. You may be called out as worship leaders, but God has a plan for you. And whatever his plan is for you, he wants you to be obedient to it. As it happens, there are quite a few people, I would dare to say the majority of people who are a part of the local church, whose job in the kingdom is solely to go to work every day, work hard with their hands, make a living for them and their family, and to serve the Lord and their neighbors with love and humility. And part of that service is actually contributing to the people who are called to go. You know, if you are called to go from city to city, to bounce around from place to place, although that might not be the lifestyle that you feel called to or feel exceptionally um, uh, comfortable with, it doesn't mean that God hasn't called other people to do that. Well, when you're bouncing from city to city and town to town, brothers and sisters, you're going to need some sort of consistent income so that you can eat, so that you can continue to travel. Um, and brothers and sisters, I, I just want to encourage you today that those people who are participating in the gospel ministry remotely, far away from you, they need to be contributed to as well. But there are some rules for it. I just want you to know it's not the Wild West of, hey, fund our ministry. Paul gives some very practical steps here about what we should do and how should we participate as a Christian in our culture. So good news. There are a bunch of people asking you for money these days, and here's a great filter for you to apply to your life that you might not be fooled and you might not be deceived by it. Now, this is not going to be an exhaustive presentation of what we're going to talk about on Sunday. Um, this is a pre-recorded message, and it is a summary of what we're going to be covering on Sunday. So be sure to tune in on Sunday. Uh, via live attendance in order to see uh, the full message. 
But brothers and sisters, I'm encouraged. Let's read God's word together today. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. God's word says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it's fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you today that Paul wanted his Corinthian church to be prepared with a special offering before he arrived. Now, there's a lot of wisdom in what he is saying here. First of all, the Apostle Paul, who was responsible for bringing the gospel, if not to the Corinthian church directly, he at least has spent time there discipling them. He cares about them deeply, which is why he's written them a letter. And he is encouraging them to set apart a gift, a donation to give to a church in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, because they are going through a difficult time. There are a lot of uh, there's a lot of speculation as to why Paul wanted to raise money for the Jerusalem church, and nobody really knows. So let me give you two um, possibilities. But just know the reason the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what the need was is because he's actually giving us great instructions on how to attend to Christian ministry. You'll see that as we unpack all the details of this message. The first reason people think that Paul wanted them to give money um, to the Jerusalem church is because literally they had been displaced. I don't know if you guys remember this, but in 70 AD, the church at Jerusalem, the temple of Jerusalem, was burned to the ground. Uh, Nero went wild. He killed and crucified Christians. He put them along the highways uh, for everyone to mock. And he, um, he was on a rampage to destroy them. So as you can imagine, commerce in Jerusalem was pretty iffy at that time. And if you were a Christian and you were doing discipleship, if you were doing ministry, not only could you not work in public, you couldn't hardly minister in public. You probably had lost your home. You probably lost loved ones and you were displaced. And so the church in Jerusalem needed donations to care for one another. That's one theory. Another theory is that this is pre the fall of Neo, uh, the pre the fall of Jerusalem, and, and pre the devastation that Nero brought. And because of that, he's um, possibly asking the Gentile Christians. Remember, the Corinth is not Jew, right? Corinth is Gentile. So these Gentile Christians, they could give to the Jewish Christian Church to show unity. You guys remember that oftentimes the Jews were um, suspicious of converts from uh, the Gentiles. And what I want to encourage you about today is that possibly Paul wanted to help bridge that gap by saying, look, we Gentiles want to participate in your Jewish church as you guys struggle so that we can let you know that we are one family under one God following one Jesus. And so that's one way you can show unity is by supporting one another fiscally. I mean, that shouts from the rooftop that we support you both privately to the individual, but also to the public. And so what did God say? God said, they will know you by your love for one another. And so those are two possibilities of why they may have been taking up a collection. But there's always a need, isn't there? In our culture, there's always a need. There's somebody who's homeless. There's somebody who's going through a difficult time. There's a widowed pastor's wife who's about to lose her home because they didn't have retirement. There are always situations in which we can give and we can give wisely so that people can know the love that we have for one another and so that people can share in the blessings that God has abundantly given us. I want you to notice too that there is a collection to be taken up for the saints. This is not a tithe for the church. This is a special offering. This is above and beyond what they would normally give to the church. In our church, we have a number of special offerings throughout the year. One of them is for the Wakulla Pregnancy Center. One of them is for, for the Florida Baptist Children's Home. One of them is for the Lottie Moon offering. And one of them is for the uh, Annie Armstrong offering. We have a number of special offerings set apart with designated purposes that you're supposed to give to above and beyond your tithes as God has given you the ability to do so. 
And so for those of you who are a part of my church and you're a part of a local church, keep that in mind as we talk about what the rules are for giving. So why did Paul take up a special collection? Because there was a need. Was it the tithe and the offering? No, it was above and beyond the tithe and the offering. And now we also see that he didn't just tell one church to do this. He's also instructing other churches. He calls out Galatia by name. So many times in the book of Corinthians, Paul will tell the Corinthian church, look, it's not like I'm just telling you to do this. I preach this everywhere I go. And so what I want you to understand is that when you prepare to give, it's not something that God's picking on you about. He's not just trying to pick your pocket. He actually wants the entire church to be generous towards one another, towards the work of the kingdom, because that is what we're living for, brothers and sisters. We are living for one another and for the kingdom of God as we are here on earth. So brothers and sisters, let's continue. He says, on the first day of every week, each one of, as each one of you prospers, they're to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections may be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it's fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So here we have in verses uh, two, on verse two, we have a command to save for the work. It may keep, come as a surprise to you, but God and Paul expect you to be wise with your money and with your time and with your talents and with what he has entrusted to you. That means that there is a part of your life that you need to discipline so that you can save for the future. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not just good economic policy to have a retirement. It's not just good economic policy to manage your funds and not spend every dime you have. In fact, Paul says you need to plan for expected expenses long before they come. And I know that that's a shock to many of you. You say, that's not my personality type. I don't look down the road. Well, brothers and sisters, it is a Christian characteristic of wisdom and godly living to think about others and to think about the kingdom of God more than your immediate circumstances. So he tells them to plan. And what they're supposed to do is set aside on the first day of the week. That's also called Sunday, the Lord's Day, when they attend at church. So there's a good idea that they're actually bringing this money that they've saved and bringing it to the church so that the church can hold it in a collective pot, a designated offering, so that when Paul arrives, he will be able to get it. So what are three reasons why we want to prepare to give, why we want to plan to give, why we want to set this type thing apart ahead of time? Well, number one, just very practically, we prepare to give so that there's no guilt in giving. You know, when you decide a long time beforehand that you're going to give, then when the person shows up, you will not be guilted into giving. When you see someone you love in need at your door, you feel guilted into giving. You may very well want to help, but brothers and sisters, if you are prepared, if you had set money apart, instead of feeling guilty and wondering where I'm going to get this money, you will be prepared and you will be blessed because you'll be excited. This is what God has been preparing for. This is what we've been preparing for. And you'll get to give with a generous heart. There'll be no guilt associated with it. I grew up in a culture that had evangelists that would travel around and they would always take up a love offering and there would be a moment where they had to appeal to us about their very true and very real needs of ministry. And I used to despise them for doing that. It made me feel awkward. It made me feel guilty. But the truth is my parents knew and other people knew for months ahead of time that these guys were coming and that we were going to give them a love offering. And so they had a chance to prepare beforehand and give generously as a rejoicing in the giftedness of the speaker who came. Me, who wasn't prepared, felt very guilty as I sat in the pews. And sometimes I gave begrudgingly. But brothers and sisters, I want to tell you today, if you prepare to give, you can avoid the sense of guilt and you can rejoice in the offering of the money. Number two, if you prepare to give... Um, it won't hurt as much. It won't. If you have 50 bucks tucked away and you're at the end of the month and you can barely pay your bills and the evangelist comes and you pay them the 50 bucks, and I'm not talking about just evangelists. That's just something we're familiar with. Somebody comes by, they have a need. Maybe the church has a planned need, the Annie Armstrong offering. You've set that 50 bucks apart for the Annie Armstrong offering. 
Well, then when it comes around and you drop that money in the plate, you're not going to wonder whether you can make ends meet at the end of the month. It's not an impulsive, lust-filled, guilt-driven offering. No, brothers and sisters, it is an offering that has been well planned out. And whether it is $100, $10, or $0.10, cents, it brings glory to God because you planned it, you purposed it, and then you fulfilled that plan to give to God's ministry. I want you to notice in this passage that Paul says you're supposed to give weekly, regularly, right? Setting it apart on a pay period at the church. And you're also supposed to only give in proportion of how much you have prospered. Prosperity above and beyond, right? So you're giving out of your abundance. You're not the widow at home trying to give so that God might bless you more. You're not planting a seed offering so that God can bless you more. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to encourage you today. If you're prepared to give, then what will happen is it won't hurt you or your family when it comes time to give that money. So prepare to avoid guilt, to avoid the hurt of having to pinch pennies and scrounge them up and the having to uh, stay one step ahead of the creditor. But number three, you ought to prepare so that you won't squander it on meaningless things. You guys know, and I know, that we have far more money available than we think. We don't slow down to think about it much, but if you go to the vending machine three times a week at work and you get a bag of chips because you're hungry, well, guess what? That's about $4 a week that you could have saved. That is $12 a month that you could give to Annie Armstrong. But if you had any, if you had planned to set apart per pay period X number of dollars for Lottie Moon's offering or the Baptist Children's Home offering, well, then what will happen is when it comes time to frivolously spend your money away, nickel and dime your money away, here and there buying the extra pack of gum, buying the extra Starbucks drink, when it comes to that, you'll be able to say no because you have already designated that money and you've already spent that money towards building God's kingdom and not fulfilling some fleeting, menial, small lust. Again, I want you to remember, this is out of your prosperity. This special offering is not out of giving you, putting you into poverty. This is a gift that you give according to your prosperity. I just want you to remember that so you don't feel guilty. So when we, pre when we prepare to give, which is what Paul wants the church to do, we avoid guilt. We avoid the pain of having to come up with the money and the possibility of injuring our family or our finances. We also, brothers and sisters, we stop spending money on frivolous things. These are all wonderful results of planning to give. And best of all, we get to see the kingdom grow. We get to empower people to go and tell the gospel. And we get to go and clothe people and, and, and ensure people who are doing gospel ministry work so that one day they'll be provided for when they retire. We get to do so many things, whether it's funding missionaries through the Southern Baptist Convention or whether personally giving to specific missionaries like we do with the wells and like we do with the parks. And so, brothers and sisters, just keep preparing to give. Set apart in your heart, out of the abundance of what God's given you, each pay period, something to give to these ministries as we consider emulating what the church did in the New Testament. And then finally, he says, when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send with them letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it's fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Here's the thing. Paul is telling them very simply, very clearly, that when you give, you go. Paul's not saying if you give, you have no part of the ministry that's going on away from you. When you give, it actually binds you to the ministry and gives you a responsibility to the ministry. One of the problems we have is that when we give, we don't go. Many of us don't want to give to an organization that we have no idea how they spend the money. If you want to get an inspired giver, talk to somebody who just came back from the mission field and saw where the money is going looked on the faces that were impoverished, saw the homes, the dilapidated state of the homes of the missionaries who were serving there. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you like Paul did, when you get your gift together, go and deliver it. Go and deliver it. We may not give John and Molly their delivery of their um, yearly stipend 
a face to face every time, but we need to go to Africa at some point and see the ministry that we are a part of. We need to show them that we are not just a church in America and they're a church in Africa, but that we are brothers and sisters and we're building unity together as we give to one another's ministries. And so, brothers and sisters, first of all, when we give, it makes us a part of a mission. Second of all, it gives us skin in the game. It makes us care about the work that's going on. It's so easy in this world to forget that there's a whole earth going with the kingdom growing. It's so easy to forget that people are suffering and that people are being converted and that there's wonderful things going on around the world because we are lost in our daily lives. Giving regularly and going makes you have skin in the game. You remember what's going on and it affects you. It affects your spirit. It affects your emotions. And so, brothers and sisters, it's important to give, but it's also important to go. And then finally, um, it also gives you accountability for where your money goes. You see, I told you that Paul was wise. A lot of people don't see why they should give because they don't understand the ministry or they don't understand where the money's going. And they don't want to be bad stewards of God's resources. Well, that's where going helps clarify the issue. Or you as a church send a representative to herald for you guys. And when they come back, they're able to report to you exactly what you're funding and exactly what's going on. So I want to encourage you all, brothers and sisters, that when you give and when you go, you're actually helping to hold accountable the people whom you're entrusting with your money. You're building relationships with them. You're supporting them. You are actively engaged in a mission with them. You're not just passively supporting at home. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I want you to be encouraged about giving in the New Testament, giving in the church today. There are going to be special offerings that we ask you to give to. We want you to plan to give to those things. Make a weekly or monthly or biweekly offering out of your check so that you can be giving to these um these offerings as they pop up and so that it won't be a burden to you and you won't feel guilty about it and you'll get to participate. But I want you to also, as the church gives these funds to different entities, I want you to volunteer to go to deliver them there so you can see what the money is actually paying for, to see the missionaries and the work that they're doing, to see the people that are being ministered to, so you can herald the kingdom and the kingdom work that's going on when you come back to your church. It will impassion you. It will embolden you to give more abundantly. The attitude of the church in the New Testament is one of generosity. There are going to be some who have more money. There's going to be some that have less. But each one is expected to contribute, according to Paul, as they have the ability, based on the prosperity that God has given them. And the best way to do that is to plan. So for those of you who don't have much money, plan. And you'll be able to give something. To those of you who are rich and wealthy, plan, and you may be able to give more than you expected. You see, God expects us to use the gifts that he has given us so that his kingdom can grow. We are just governors. We are just stewards of what God has entrusted to us. He gives us all good things. The reason why we hesitate to give is because we believe providence or provision for our families and ourselves depends on our work alone. The truth is, brothers and sisters, every good gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights. He is the one who gives us all good things. And so what he expects is for us to be his hands and feet and to dole out those good things to his kingdom and the needs that are in it. So brothers and sisters, let's have a heart that's bent towards generosity. Let's have a heart that's bent towards giving. But let's do it wisely and let's hold each other accountable to not only give, but to go so that we can give to the ministries that God is truly blessing and that have true needs. I want you to notice one final thing as we close. The situation in which they're giving to in this instance is a group of believers. Now, the rules that Paul lays down here that he teaches at other churches as well is to support kingdom ministry. And so it's not just to feed the homeless. It's not just to meet the needs of some local kids for Christmas. It's not just doing those kinds of things. That may be involved, perhaps, 
But brothers, one of the sis and sisters, one, the command we have is to love one another, the king, the kingdom of God, the, the brothers and sisters in the kingdom to support them as they bring the gospel, the gospel to other places. And as they do gospel centered work, my final admonition to you would be stop giving to stop giving to organizations that aren't gospel centered. We want to see the kingdom of God come so that people can be set free from their sin. I do know that there are people who are starving. I do know that there are people who are dying. And there are many people who are trying to meet those needs, those only, only those needs, apart from the gospel. Brothers and sisters, let them do their work. There are also plenty of organizations that are gospel-centered trying to do the same thing. Let's give our money to those people so that not only will, the, will their bellies be full, but their souls will be made alive. Not only will they get a hand up, but I'm not, not only will they get a hand out, but they'll also get a hand up to build their lives upon the rock of Jesus Christ, to change themselves, to get out of the bondage of sin. And so I just want to encourage you in that as we close today. So ladies and gentlemen, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I hope that as you get involved with a local church or as you join us on Sunday at Pioneer, you'll be encouraged as you consider how God has called us to give to special offerings at our local congregations. I love you guys. And just to be honest, you guys know this already. I pretty much preached the whole sermon. So if you show up tomorrow, you'll hear it again. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great day.